Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to do an overview of the cranial part of the parasympathetic nervous system. So the parasympathetic nervous system, recall, is the rest and digest half of the nervous system. So if you're sitting here watching this video, assuming that you don't have anxiety about your exam tomorrow, then probably your parasympathetic nervous system has vast control over your entire body. And that parasympathetic nervous system has two parts. It has a cranial part, and then it also has a sacral part, which we'll discuss in a separate video. So it's often called not only the parasympathetic nervous system, but also uh, the craniosacral division of the autonomic nervous system. The way that the parasympathetic nervous system is organized is we basically have what's called a three neuron system. The first neuron is not shown here. These neurons ultimately are going to come from the cerebral cortex and then they're going to lead to these neurons whose cell bodies are in the brainstem. So the brainstem consists of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. So for example, you can see one of these neurons right here. This would be the second neuron in sequence because the first one comes from the cerebral cortex. And that cell body is located in the brainstem. And that second neuron synapses with a third whose cell body is located in some ganglion. And these ganglia are clusters of cell bodies that are located somewhere just in the head. Okay, we're not too much concerned about locations here. What we are concerned about are the specific nuclei, the specific connections, and then the specific functions of this. All right, so if you want locations, you'll be looking in a different video. This is really just showing the general connections that we've got here. Let's start with the oculomotor nerve. This is cranial nerve three. This is one of four cranial nerves that has parasympathetic function. Those are oculomotor, facial, glossopharyngeal, and vagus. Now with the oculomotor nerve, if we look at the second neuron right here, of course this is many neurons, it's not just one, but these neurons have their cell bodies here in the midbrain, and the cluster of these cell bodies is often called the Edinger-Westphal nucleus, sometimes just abbreviated to EW nucleus. So if you see EW nucleus, this is the cell bodies of these neurons right here that are located in the midbrain, and they belong to the oculomotor nerve. Now, if we follow these neurons out of the midbrain, they're going to synapse with another set of neurons whose cell bodies are located in what's called the ciliary ganglion. Okay? Ciliary ganglion, this belongs to the oculomotor nerves. This is part of the parasympathetic function, cranial nerve three. These third neurons, Here's their cell bodies in the ciliary ganglion. They then project into the eyes, okay? And they're going to control pupillary constriction, and they're going to produce bulging of the lens. So in the eye, we really have two sets of ciliary muscles. We have some ciliary muscles that actually, when contracted, they produce pupillary constriction. So these are located in the iris. And so when they're stimulated, they decrease the size of the pupil. Okay, so that's pupillary constriction. We also have a ciliary body, and in the eye, the, that ciliary body is a set of muscles that are connected ultimately to the lens through these ligaments called suspensory ligaments, and when that ciliary muscle contracts, it actually produces bulging of the lens. So these neurons right here from the ciliary ganglion, these project to the eye. And whenever stimulated, they basically have two functions. One, they produce pupillary constriction. And number two, they allow the lens to bulge, which when you're reading something up close or viewing something close up, uh, this is actually a type of accommodation that allows you to focus on the object. I think we all have intuition that if you're looking at an object close up versus far away, um, you actually have to have a, ch a change in the shape of your lens. And so uh, parasympathetic function will cause bulging of that lens. Okay? So these are two functions of the oculomotor nerve, and these are parasympathetic functions. Okay? Let's move on to the facial nerve. This is the second cranial nerve that has parasympathetic function. Now regardless of which one of these ganglia we're talking about, because there's two associated with the facial nerve, uh, the cell bodies of this second set of neurons right here, remember the first is coming from the cerebral cortex, the second set of neurons, these cell bodies are located in the pons. 
And these cell bodies are clustered in what's called the superior salivatory nucleus. Superior salivatory nucleus. Now, one set of these neurons from the superior salivatory nucleus projects to this ganglion, which is called the pterygopalatine ganglion, also called the sphenopalatine ganglion. And then the other set of these neurons from the superior salivatory nucleus projects to this ganglion, which is called the submandibular ganglion. Now, these are both going to be contributed by the facial nerve. Okay? These are going to be parasympathetic parts of the facial nerve. However, depending on which ganglion they send neurons to, it's going to dictate the function. So if we look at this top set of neurons that go to the pterygopalatine ganglion, they're going to synapse with this third neuron right here. And these neurons are going to project ultimately to really the nose and the eye. In terms of the eye, these neurons will have branches to the lacrimal glands. Remember the lacrimal glands are these glands that are situated on the superior lateral border of the eye, kind of in the orbit, and they're going to be involved in the production of tears. In terms of the nose, there are nasal glands that really just kind of lubricate the nasal cavity and prevent it from drying out. So those are functions of the parasympathetic part of the facial nerve. If we look at these other neurons that are coming ultimately from the superior salivatory nucleus, they project to the submandibular ganglion. And then they synapse there with these third neurons. And then those neurons project really to the sort of the mouth area. And they're going to innervate the sublingual and submandibular glands. These are two of our extrinsic salivary glands. And so you can imagine they're going to allow salivation. Okay. So when we think of uh, the sublingual and submandibular glands, these are controlled by the facial nerve. Right? So you can see here, depending on which ganglion these neurons go to, that's going to dictate what function they're going to have. All right? Now the third cranial nerve that has parasympathetic function is the glossopharyngeal nerve, cranial nerve number nine. So if we look here, uh, again, the first neuron is really coming from the cerebral cortex. That's going to synapse with the second neuron right here, whose cell bodies are clustered in the medulla, and they're clustered in a region called the inferior salivatory nucleus. Okay? So these second neurons, they're going to project to this ganglion right here called the otic ganglion. Otic means ear. So this is going to be more lateral, uh, not in the ear specifically, but closer to it. And then in the otic ganglion, the second neuron right here synapses with this third, and these neurons then project to the parotid glands. So while the facial nerve, cranial nerve 7, controls the sublingual and submandibular glands, those are two extrinsic salivary glands, the glossopharyngeal nerve, through this parasympathetic function, controls the parotid gland. Okay, and the parotid gland, one on each side, these are going to be also extrinsic salivary glands, but they have control through a different cranial nerve, glossopharyngeal. Okay? So collectively, these three right here, parotid, sublingual, and submandibular, these make up the three extrinsic salivary glands. Now, the fourth cranial nerve that has parasympathetic function, and this is what most people think of when they think of parasympathetic, is the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve, however, is going to really have control over a much larger area. It's going to have some control um, in the pharynx and larynx, but a huge amount of it's going to be into the thorax and the abdomen. So the vagus nerve's function is much more widespread. So cranial nerve 10. So again, those uh, first neurons are coming from the cerebral cortex. They synapse with the second set of neurons right here. And these cell bodies are clustered as the dorsal nucleus of the vagus nerve in green right here. This is also in the medulla. Now, these second neurons are going to project out and go to a wide variety of areas. So we can see here it supplies the organs of the head, the thorax and abdomen, and also the proximal half of the large intestine all the way down to the level of the splenic flexure. Now, again, it doesn't serve all of the large intestine, as you can see there, but a lot of other things have innervation from the vagus nerve in the thorax and the abdominal cavities. Okay? Uh, for example, in the heart, uh, we know that the sinoatrial node, the pacemaker of the heart, has innervation from the vagus nerve. And the way this works is, 
that the different branches of the vagus nerve that go to different areas, whether it be in the head, the thorax, the abdomen, all these branches are going to eventually synapse with a third neuron right here, which is just going to be in a ganglion near the target organ. So there's a lot of these. So for example, if this were going to the sinoatrial node, this ganglion right here would be very close to the sinoatrial node. If this were something in the proximal half of the large intestine, this ganglion would be very close to that region of the large intestine. And you can see there that it synapses with this third neuron, which then has a short distance to travel to that particular target organ. Okay, And then it will exert that function. So Hopefully, this diagram in this video gave you a good understanding of the various cranial nerves, there's four of them, that have parasympathetic functions, and they really all are going to follow a similar pattern. They're all going to have this first neuron that's not shown here that's coming from the cerebral cortex, which then is going to synapse with the second neuron uh, whose cell body is somewhere here in the brainstem, one in the midbrain, one in the pons, and two in the medulla. Those second neurons then project out to some ganglion where they synapse with a third neuron, which then goes to the particular area that has the function. So if you're the oculomotor nerve, it's in the eye for pupillary constriction and lens bulging. If you're the facial nerve, it goes to the, the nasal and ocular area for the nasal glands and lacrimal glands and it goes to the maxillary and mandibular area, so the sublingual and submandibular glands. If you're the glossopharyngeal nerve, it goes to the parotid glands. And if you're the vagus nerve, well, your function is very, very widespread throughout the body. So please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.